finally, this is the part three. We are going to be intra pressure session. Discussing the question after that. If we will come to the, then the anti-second examination or dilatation. So, so long we in the eyelid, the eye relationship we study all the structures on the whatever you can see with the gross eye from the nictitans membrane, the cherry eye, or any uh, dermoid cyst, any growth on the cornea. So, all this we have assessed. Now, further coming down, you have the anterior segment, and that is the anterior chamber. So, anterior chamber, when you go, you have the anterior as well as posterior. So, in the posterior chamber, you will find the lens. So, you have studied that in the module one. So, to study or to declare anything on the lens, you have to necessarily dilate the pupil and then proceed. Then comes the posterior segment after a pupil once dilated, lens study, posterior segment study. Additional diagnostic techniques are indicated if you are going for a DCR, gonioscopy, B scan, keratometry, A scan, patchymetry, thickness, ERG, OCT, and chromatic PLR. So these are all additional diagnostic tests which can be conducted at the by the veterinary ophthalmologist in his clinic or her clinic. Now, intraocular pressure. So there are various methods to study the intraocular pressure, and this is the earliest thing which we were using intraocular pressure IOP mm mercury in it gives pressure in millimeters of mercury and it was discovered by the scientist Schiotz. So it's called Schiotz tonometer and necessarily you should calibrate the Schiotz tonometer and check for yeah. it, um, graduation the needle should be in zero prior to use. Uh, and then you will be able to do this test very effectively in the animal. One advantage of the shear stronometer is you have to raise the animal's head and then do the test. So that is why nowadays we have the, so these are the various uh, cleaning instruments, uh, cleaning brushes you find in the shear stronometer. I always prefer to use also an antibiotic. Immediately I clean the foot plate of the shear stronometer with an antibiotic and then proceed. So tronopen is also there, uh, which is a little costly one and also it is highly like uh, if one somebody is using the next person because it is highly sensitive to touch so this is the area where you normally uh, touch the press and then look for the readings uh, so this is uh, principles are different like in shear tonometer actually indentation tonometer indentation in the sense if the pressure is more the indentation will be less so also the scale reading will be less and here it is based on the applanation tonometer Applanation that means the take any part of the cornea. So, what happens any part of the cornea when you take you have a curved portion? So, th the pressure required to make this small curve plane, so that is called the applanation tonometer. So, that pressure is uh, you can directly read the pressure in this window. I am actually very happy to use the Shear's tonometer that was because I'm, um, I am so that's what we were using early. And I am very good in using the shear tonometer also, I should say. And But only thing is you should uh, have a very good uh, calibration and see that the scale reading is zero prior to use. One disadvantage of the shear tonometer is you won't be, you should, you need a almost a, a good cornea. The, there should not be any uh, lesions on the cornea. But by, with the help of a tonopen, even if there is a corneal ulcer, you will be able to take the measurement. Now, before installation, before studying the intraocular pressure, you have, if, if there is a discharge, you have done all those tests. So you are free to use a proper cane drops, local, this is a local anesthetic drops. You can install into the eye and then you can use the equipment. Uh, this is the torn open wet. So you can study that. So this is a drop is installed and it is repeated on both the eyes. So how often you should put? So that is also another thing. So we normally put five times, okay, uh, three times at five minutes interval. So now the shields is kept on the eye and then you are trying to examine the pressure. So you are not supposed to apply any pressure. You just keep your foot plate on the cornea and then try to check the intraocular pressure. So three readings you should take and take the average of that. And um, 
you will get the normal pressure. See the scaled reading here. And another thing I want to tell you is whenever you buy a shear stonometer, there will be a graduation scale um, with the readings in that. So the scale uh, with the mark uh, pressure uh, will be marked against the readings. But this, this uh, thing is not useful. That is meant for human beings. So there is a converted chart for the canines. So you should use that chart and then see the look for the readings. So now this also we have seen in the last module. So that once the calibration is good, the machine is ready for use. So having said these two types of uh, intraocular pressure reading, now you have one more thing that is the um, rebound tonometer. So you don't have to worry for uh, anesthesia and you can directly take the equipment and then measure. You can, when you shine light, can you see some circular ring? So that is called the placido ring. So when you get a good placido ring, you will get a good reading. Otherwise it will say too far or too near, etc. Or it will ask you to repeat the test. So you have to take six readings and take the average of that. And then, so that is a very good instrument. But in the normal um, uh, settings, uh, different types of intraocular uh, pressure uh, equipments, the tonometry, uh, the best thing is, uh, they say, is tone up and wet. Okay. Uh, that is very commonly used by many um, ophthalmologists abroad. Now, this is a cat with a secondary glaucoma is very common in case of cats. And we are trying to see the pressure. You see the reading here. This is 99, almost uh, very high pressure. So we immediately did a synthesis for that cat. So this intraocular um, uh, pressure, we will be checking with the tonometer. Followed by this, you have to necessarily magnify the area, illuminate the area. And if you are going to do some synthesis, you need some magnifying loops like this and then you can proceed. So illumination magnification is again important from this uh, examination point down. So this is the, sorry, the video is not playing. So just you have to use an operating microscope and make the, just wanted to show the position of the uh, dog, how you should place it under the operating microscope. So it has to be, uh, the tapetum should face the uh, bulb of the uh, operating microscope. I don't know why that video is not playing. Anyway, so these are some of the magnifying loops you can use. You can also use an indirect ophthalmoscope or magnifying loop to remove the sutures. So to finish so small, small procedures like this, you can zoom. So zoom or magnification is again very important. You can achieve with the help of a loop or a, a indirect ophthalmoscope or a um, indirect ophthalmoscope in the, or a operating microscope. So this is the line that is kept for surgery under the placed uh, for surgery under the operating microscope. The, we did the surgery in the Wanderlur Zoo. It has been published also recently. Now comes the anterior chamber. So after finishing this, the contents of the anterior chamber you have to evaluate. The transparency of the anterior chamber you have to evaluate. The depth the flare flare means whether it is transparent or whether whether it is turbid then iridocorneal angle iris and pupil so all this you can do with the help of a dark room with the magnification and focal illumination slit lamp biomicroscopy ac synthesis helps in the flare then gonioscopy for ica intra that is the iridocorneal angle iris examination iris has to be examined before dilatation and after dilatation and then the ultrasonography if there is some opacity in the path so this is the animal after the surgery this is a there is no lens in this okay so this is an aphakic eye and this is a pseudophakic eye you can see an intraocular lens in its place so this is all pseudophakia that means it is a, a lens is there but it is a artificial lens here also you can see the fundus. So the anterior chamber you can see here in the aphakic eye, in the pseudophakic eye, and also through a small a corneal opacity. So you can see the anterior chamber. How you say that you can see the anterior chamber? So that is why you can see the iris, you can see the pupillary rim, you can also yeah. see shine behind. Okay, here you can see the shine, and yeah. you can see some optics inside. So that means the anterior chamber is transparent. 
clear the people that also says that the aggregate chamber is fine there is no flare there is no uh, inflammatory exudate inside the anterior chamber corneal opacity sometimes the such type of corneal opacities will reduce the intensity of light into the eye but definitely there is, you are getting a reflex underneath so that means the chamber is fine but the lesion is only on the outside and also this sclera you can also examine from the limbus down sclera so all these are very pale and it looks normal so it is there is no inflammatory reaction going on in the eye the all these uh, pictures says that the aperture chamber is fine now comes the lens so once you dilate the eye you will be able to look into the eye lens and the lens of course you should look for its transparency opacity the position of the lens whether the lens is in its position or whether it is displaced anteriorly or posteriorly or in case of very adult lens very old lens you will find some deposits in the lens dark brown deposits they are called imperfections and very adult lens sometimes it will split and that is called nuclear sclerosis so never examine before mitriasis and you definitely need a slit ultrasonography direct ophthalmoscopy and retinoscopy to test the uh, status of the lens so following lens is the vitreous so the vitreous body can be examined with the help of a slit lamp the direct ophthalmoscope and ultrasonography when the lens is opaque so if the lens is not opaque you will be able to study the vitreous otherwise you have to definitely depend upon a b scan to study the vitreous and the posterior segment so further down if you go you have the ocular fundus that is the retinal vasculature in the fundus you have to this is the typical ocular fundus we have seen in the module 1 also of a labrador dog and you will find the presence of the optic disc between the tapetal and the non tapetal area with a roughly c shaped structure inside the um, optic disc so all this indicates that it's a normal you have the thick venules thin arterioles running inside the tapetal area it is the normal tapetal reflection is there it is not either hyper reflective or hypo reflective so this is a normal uh, fundus and this fundus you can examine with the help of a direct ophthalmoscope and also indirect ophthalmoscope fundus photography then to assess the status of the retina you need to do a electro retinography and then ultrasonography so the fundus can be examined with the help of all these equipments this is slit lamp biomicroscopy so you will get a magnification of 10 times and also you can get a magnification of 16 times so you have an illuminator about 1 to 10 mm and you have different filters also cobalt blue red free and it is a co pivotal 30 degree so at a, at a angle of 30 degree you will be able to make slits on the cornea now you will see with the help of this video yes so this is the uh, slit lamp that is available in the indian market and it has got a base and here you have the charger tower and you have a on and off switch here and you can turn around and see that and this is the illumination tower and this is the charger tower and here 
you have the oculus so they have the two eye pieces are there and according to your refraction here you can see the refraction no so according to that refraction you can adjust the refraction status and then the ipd also can be adjusted between the you are according to your ipd and there is a rheostat here rheostat means it is a switch to control the intensity of light so with the help of the rheostat you will be able to adjust the light and you can see again that and now you can increase the brightness or decrease the brightness and additionally you have at the base of the illumination this is the illumination tower at the base of the illumination tower you have this cobalt free red free filters and so you have to toggle between the uh, around a uh, one circular frame here then you will get all these uh, different types of filters and so the very minute movement you have to do and also apertures also you can change the size then then the uh, you can also it will span it ac across the cornea so the this actually this beam there is a circular dial here so this circular dial helps you to make a slit also on the eye so that is why in the next picture in the next uh, uh, here in this video you know whether you have seen this video also so you are trying to make an optical section of the eye so the light is now uh, allowed to fall on the retina on the cornea and you can see a shadow of that here so it is actually the shadow you should read so you get two different so in fact the distance also you can also measure the ac depth with this that is why i said in the cornea when you do with the opacity you get two lines here and the corneal thickness also can be measured with the help of a portable slit lamp it is a very highly useful equipment which you, all of you should have in your clinical setting only thing is you should have some you should develop a, try to have experience with the equipment and uh, develop a proficiency in using it then it will be easier this is a direct ophthalmoscope which we were uh, we actually saw in the module 1 and so you, you have the on and off switch so you have to press that and then turn around so that is how you switch on the machine and you also have different types of filters here okay so this is a circular dial so you can turn around and see the circular dial as and when you work on the circular dial you will get different types of apertures so that are uh, that actually different colors so this is blue thing so the blue one is very important some direct ophthalmoscopes comes out without this blue okay so uh, for example this pocket type will, uh, doesn't have so you will not be able to use on a corneal ulcer case slit is also there and um, these are different apertures of different sizes so why we have different apertures is when you get a rat when you get a lab animal you have to refract the lab animal eye also so there you have to use a small aperture so, and again the circular uh, dial can be changed to the green color and the size can be uh, the slit or the larger aperture or the smaller aperture also can be uh, adjusted in the uh, colored part also so in the amber colored and also in the slit then on one side you will find the circular dial so this is another circular dial you will find on one side this is called a lens magazine and as you turn the lens magazine that lens diopter power will appear here and the green um, uh, green numbers indicates that it is a positive lens and the red numbers indicates that it is a negative lens the magnification is 15 times but the disadvantage of the direct ophthalmoscope is the short working distance see the sh very short working distance so you have the light source you are happy we have a good lens magazine you can see very structures we have the circular dial 15 times magnification so that means at one point of time you will be able to see only some 9 to 10 degree of the area now you see the demo of this so this is the of the ophthalmoscope that is set and when you work on the animal you have to work start working from a distance and what you are aiming you are aim, trying to aim at the any opacities in the path of the eye okay, starting from the cornea and you are also trying to look into the tapetal reflection if there is cataract you won't be able to see but otherwise if there is a tapetal reflection you try to aim at the tapetal reflection and now you go very near to the animal 
the right eye of the animal should be examined by the right eye of the um, uh, exam by with the right eye of the examiner and the left eye vice versa so now after going to this area the equipment the direct ophthalmoscope will be very near to your eye okay and now when you move you have to move as a single piece the equipment and the eye your head should move as a single you are not supposed to take the equipment now out from your eye okay so that is you you should move as a single unit now what we have achieved by doing this with the direct ophthalmoscope first i said you have to with the at a distance you have to look for the tapetal reflection see you have got the tapetal reflection now after getting the tapetal reflection there are some set there are some set diopters to examine different structures inside the eye okay it starts with a plus 20 on the cornea so when you work on the cornea you can see here some anomaly the cornea lost its luster it is not transparent you can see something new here there is discharge as well as vascularization so panus is there so this type of panus you will be able to read well even a minute here you have plenty of uh, vascularization but sometimes you will find very one thin vessel running so that also you will be able to examine with the help of a plus 20 diopter in the direct ophthalmoscope now when you go further down in the anterior chamber this is a you can see strands coming from different angles so this is again a persistent pupillary membrane this is a congenital defect in, uh, i'm getting uh, uh, number of cases now with the persistent pupillary membrane so this is a congenital defective inherited uh, disorder so for examination of this you have to use a plus 12 diopter so you can slowly turn the circular dial or the lens magazine and work on plus 12 and now coming to the anterior chamber so this is in the further down so coming to the anterior chamber you can work on the plus 15 so in the plus 15 plus 15 plus 15 plus 15 okay you have four plus 15s but what are your what structures you are going to see here in the same thing because you are seeing a pathology that's why i'm telling you so in plus 15 you are able to see the uh, you are able to see the lens plus 12 also gives you the little about the anterior chamber at the lens now you can come to this plus 15 you can see some structures inside okay it is not a very clear picture but at least you can see the haptic of the intraocular lens so when the intraocular lens is placed after cataract surgery you are supposed to use that plus 15 okay and this is also you can also see an intraocular lens here following surgery so again plus 15 now you are seeing something else it is not lens it is not iris it is not a surgery uh, was not done but you can see some tissues running here okay that is the retina so the retina got detached and it has come to the position of the that is why i have kept this diagrammatic uh, line so the retina detached from here and it has jumped up to the level of the retina uh, of the lens okay so because it has occupied the structure of the up to the lens now you have to use a plus 15 to view the retinal detachment now further down if you go for the examination of the vitreous you can go for the plus eight and the fundus so for the from the fundus down that is somewhere here in the labina cribrosa and all these structures if you want to see you have to use from zero to minus two so all these uh, plus indicates green indicates plus and the minus indicates negative lenses and the zero will be marked as uh, red, um, black okay so the minus two to zero to minus three is the power you use for the studying the optic disc sometimes if you see the optic disc as plus five that means the optic disc is pushed more towards the vitreous if there is glaucoma sometimes the what happens the optic disc can be pushed backwards okay so that it's a pathognomonic sign that is called the cupping of the optic disc this optic disc instead of here it will be pushed backward so what you have to do you have to necessarily reduce the power my to minus five and then examine so when you keep at minus five i'm or i will put it in this way a dilated pupil is brought to you uh, for examination and you are um, uh, direct ophthalmoscopic reading for examination of the optic disc is, disc is minus five so that indicates that there is cupping of the optic disc and the animal has, is having glaucoma so this is a very interesting 
um, uh, equipment where you have to necessarily uh, you should uh, experience the use of different uh, adapters for different tissues so once you get uh, proficient then you will be able to uh, confidently use on a clinical case so indirect ophthalmoscope so indirect ophthalmoscope is again um, uh, we have studied here so the, here one of our uh, under postgraduate student is trying to use that so this video is mainly to tell you that the left hand is used the condensing lens was placed in the left hand for examination of the right eye and for the left eye the lens is placed on the right okay so you are not supposed to use the um, left hand for the right or etc so it should be in line so what is the idea here the lens the interposed lens as well as the eye and the examiner's eye so all these should come in line then you will be able to examine the eye so here also when you use the condensing lens the biconvex part should be more towards the animal side and you have a white ring for that and you can bring the uh, thing very near towards the eye it is the animal yeah so you can also check that and then bring it towards the eye so position the head of the patient straight towards you so what i used to tell the patient is the nose towards me okay always i used to tell them now i am keeping my index finger it is fixed on the periorbital area and now with the help of only the first finger forefinger and the thumb i am trying to move the condensing lens back and forth to get uh, to get the image in focus or also to get even if the image is in focus sometimes you get also magnification while doing so so you're not supposed to take your hand while doing this okay when the animal moves you also have to move along with the animal now special ophthalmic procedures are out there like corneal patchymetry corneoscopy mabography retinoscopy retinoscopy is something to check whether the animal is the power of the lens power of the eye the refraction of the eye whether it's myopic hyperopic and uh, what is what is the residual uh, refraction error that is present after putting an intraocular lens in its place so the animal is not going to read then the anterior chamber synthesis that is also one of the diagnostic procedures vitreous synthesis then dacryocystorhinography ultrasonography advanced diagnostic procedures on the eye like ct scan chromatic plr electroretinography and fundus photography so the corneal patchymetry is very important the thickness of the cornea normally we used to study the it is also simulate a small probe is there so you can keep the small probe on the uh, desensitized cornea and the 10 measurements you can take and you can take the average of that and then assess the thickness of the cornea so that is called patchymetry then the gonioscopy so local anesthetic is applied onto the eye to desensitize the cornea and the hydrocorneal angle can be examined with the help of a, um, a gonio lens so normally we use a copy medium diagnostic gonio lens so medium diagnostic gonio lens according to the size of the eye you should use if it is a very large animal you have to necessarily use a larger size and then view the hydrocorneal angle with the help of a, even after putting the gonioscopic lens you will not be able to directly read the hydrocorneal angle because you need, definitely need some magnification either you can depend upon the slit lamp like this or with the help of a operating microscope you can position you can actually give a general anesthesia and then position the animal under microscope and then study the hydrocorneal angle so this is a very good um, uh, not exactly you actually measure with the help of a gonio lens is the thickness of the uh, trabecula as well as the pectineal ligament so if they are not spread sufficiently that means they are closed and it, it it is saying that it is a closed angle glaucoma so to check whether an open angle glaucoma or closed angle glaucoma whether your medications are going to work whether it needs a medical therapy or a surgical therapy so all this you will be able to study better with the help of a gonio lens
retinoscopy is of course it is a part of the research work it is it doesn't carry importance much in the clinical settings anterior chamber synthesis so this is also one of the important uh, uh, diagnostic method so whenever there is hypo hyphema or hypopion or malignant glaucoma like this so invariably you get uh, sarcomas in cats very commonly and it will end up in enucleation of the eye so initially to remove the fluid and to check whether the tumorous cells are there you can do a synthesis and also you, it uh, helps in relieving the fluid from the eye the pain will be reduced so cytology and protein analysis can be done with the help of uh, aqueous tumor sampling from the anterior chamber directly like this so uh, either you can sedate the patient you don't require a general anesthesia you can sedate the patient and then remove the fluid so if it is for a diagnostic purpose in a normal eye you are supposed to remove only 0.2 to 0.5 ml otherwise if it is a in case of malignant melanoma like the glaucoma like this you can remove more fluid from the eye a scan so the biometry we were talking about the various spaces in the eye the anterior chamber the posterior chamber etc the space in the eye and also the significance of the dimensions of the eye so this carries very high importance in the uh, intraocular lens uh, power calculation so preoperatively to evaluate the intraocular lens power and also to study the prosthetic globe size uh, a scan is a very good indication is there and also to useful for taking small lesions on the retina so depending upon the spikes you will be able to study so here you can you get spikes according to the interference on the tissues so if there is some strands or choroidal detachment you will get additional spikes here okay so with that you will be able to see some small lesions also you will be able to with practice it comes so you can desensitize the cornea and then you can go for a keep the uh, a scan probe on the eye and then get the readings so you have different types of machines in the market and um, my preferred thing is dgh that is the best available and uh, this is the in the case of os os means that is the left eye and od is the right eye so in the os the axial length is 20 the anterior chamber depth is 4.02 uh, mm and lens is 2 to 2.04 mm thickness then ultrasonography is also ocular ultrasonography is gaining importance along with the ultrasonography you do on other areas of the uh, on other systems so a scan is uh, mainly to amplitude scan whereas this is a b scan b more ultrasound scan so the um, uh, frequency which you should use is it uh, maximum is 7.5 but you can use up to 18 uh, mega frequency 18 hz uh, frequency hertz frequency and the different positions you have to employ that is the horizontal vertical and oblique positioning can be used this is the machine we use here for our ocular b more ultrasound and you can see the probe that is placed on the animal and so here you have kept the probe on the animal uh, the probe is placed vertically so this is the longitudinal so if the animal is not uh, cooperating we can it is enough if you want to uh, study with the help of a one uh, longitudinal view alone so in the longitudinal view itself you got some readings like see the, this is a lens and here you can see the vitreous degeneration so what uh, it's a case of cataract so you can tell them that the prognosis after cataract surgery will be less because vitreous degeneration is also there presence of vitreous degeneration alone will not cause visual loss following surgery but because the vitreous degeneration is there the vitreous is not in its proper gel form okay there can be sinuresis so subsequently after cataract surgery vision will be there for three months and subsequently there will be loss of vision so such prognosis you will be able to tell by studying the vitreous now this is a computerized axial tomography the one of the i can say the highest now diagnostic method that is available to study the eye and though ct is not the actual uh, highest uh, diagnostic test for the eye it is the mri but at least with the ct ct also you will be able to study so this case was brought to us with the help with the lens luxation so we did the lens luxation some two years before and after two years that the dog was doing very fine it uh, it was brought with some tumor mass inside the eye so in fact that was the reason for the luxation of the lens 
so then we were not having ct so subsequently when the animal was brought after 2 years we did a ct scan and you can see the hyper hypoechoic structure here and also here some hyperechoic structure of the tumorous mass so you can also say additionally whether there is infiltration into the uh, orbital area whether the bony orbit is involved so all these things or the spread or rarefaction of the bony orbit all this you will be able to assess with the help of a ct this is the most advanced that is the chromatic plr now coming up that is a c plr tester and this also i have seen in the corret school of corret uh, uh, veterinary school in israel so the plr is actually in healthy canine eyes can be elicited at a very low intensity so using red and blue they have different wavelengths and in dogs with the blindness for example a sard sudden acquired retinal degeneration the people will react only to high intensity blue wavelength so you, the rods will not be giving any the loss of rod con cells will be there and hence that will not give any plr so such assessment of rods and cons you can assess again this carries more importance in the research setting electro retinography is in fact one of the most important diagnostic um, to, uh, test which you have to do prior to cataract surgery uh, in fact many equipments are also available now in the market just to do a uh, pre operative electro retinography so uh, in the clinical setting so it actually electro retinography or electro retinogram so the electrical signals from the retina are identified with the help of a uh, different intensity of light and the first you will get a negative deflection then the positive deflection so the negative deflection indicates that it is a uh, because of the rods and phone uh, cones and because of the uh, here you can see the inner nuclear layer the ganglion cell layer the axons so they give the b wave so if this it is weak we will get a little low amplitude wave and the c indicates the low deflect uh, negative a curved uh, uh, wave is there so that is the corneal uh, retinal epithelium retinal pigment epithelium so you you will be able to assess all this and if the electro retinogram is normal even a cataract is patient only the patient will be subjected to cataract surgery but necessarily i will tell you that plr can be taken as a assessment for the effect, uh, for the functioning of the retina though plr is because the plr has got a different arc we have studied in the module 1 through the pretectal nucleus of the um, oculomotor nerve so that way also you can affect a plr so presence of a plr does not indicate the presence of a vision so what you have to do in a clinical setting is you combine the plr also ask the patient owner whether the animal was having vision earlier prior to cataract surgery, cataract occurrence and then if the cataract is no then it is normal then you can proceed with the uh, surgery you will definitely get a good vision uh, prognosis after the surgery but uh, the structural deformity in the retina can be assessed with the help of a uh, b mode ultrasonography so erg is mainly to study the functional aspect of the retina so this is how this is an erg machine in the clinical setting it is not for the in a research setting and these are the various uh, additional instrument things you require necessarily you have to give a general anesthesia and the erg can be done under daylight that is the bright photic stimulation and also under scotopic stimulation so you can dark room the patient for a half an hour and then do, they do this test so this is done mainly to study the effect of the rod cells and the bright light we can study the effect of the con cells fundus camera is another important equipment you need and you now various types of fundus camera are available in the market with the help of your phone also you can take a picture of the fundus but necessarily fundus camera has additional uh, facilities where you can store the pictures and you can review the pictures when the patient is brought again you can see if there is an attenuation of the blood blood vessel inside the um, optic disc or if the vessels are coming back so all this you will be able to assess well with the help of a by reviewing the pictures which you have already taken with the fundus camera you can also transfer all these pictures into the computer also that is also one advantage so this is a cataract patient post cataract we are trying to see take the uh, image of the fundus fundus imaging is also done just to keep you updated that we have done in case of a lion also 
following cataract surgery in a lion we have done a fundus study immediately uh, so not afterwards uh, so here you can see the presence of the tep, uh, optic disc within the tapetal area this is very characteristic of the feline species the tapetum not at the junction the tapet you will see the disc in the fully in the tapetal area smartphone fundoscopy the iphone or the phonioscopy uh, i have i am actually used to this word uh, by actually somebody has given a webinar then uh, so i have copied that so we were uh, earlier also we were using from the past uh, uh, some eight years whenever the iphone came we started using the condensing lens can be interposed on the eye but uh, only one thing i want to tell you here is the condensing you get a good picture of the fundus and this can be also mounted on a adapter like this the phone can be mounted here and the condensing lens here so that you will get a good imaging or videograph of the fundus and you can take this and you can refer and send it to, uh, to the ophthalmologist to, to get a opinion also so in that way this helps in the tele ophthalmology effectively so there are some obvious lesions which you can say this is a very marked lesion you don't have to do much you know that there is a lesion okay so here also you can see obvious lesions so some cases will be presented with obvious lesions like this or some cases will be presented with non obvious lesions because it will be inside unless you effectively see the eye so you can see the lens here displaced lens is there lens has jumped into the anterior chamber but at the same time you can also see a little of the posterior so here also you can see so two or three days back only we had the uh, solar eclipse so in solar eclipse also you saw this kind of crescent shaped uh, uh, moon uh, crescent shaped sun so here you can see that same fundus um, crescent shaped fundus here and this is obscured by the displaced lens in this pictures also you can with the care you will be able to see the presence of the iris cyst inside the eye so some lesions will be non will not be clear at all in the initial examination so you have to necessarily have some patience to work on and then you will arrive at the proper diagnosis we, even if you have all these equipments uh, your first equipment i will say is patience okay so secondary lesions in the eye are very common you get eyphema or sometimes you also get pan ophthalmitis like this due to systemic affections of the liver spleen or the kidney etc so you have to concurrently work with your uh, uh, physicians and then treat such patients so this is a basic setup uh, which i have seen in the ontario veterinary college in canada so you don't have you need a very big room so this is a small uh, table with a chair so always when you do examinations in the eye you have to necessarily sit and do so we will little see some ergonomics also so you have a working station and you have a eye here to explain to the owner the diagram and this indirect ophthalmoscope is connected to the television so that you will be able to teach the students as well as to the clients the structures which you actually see with the indirect ophthalmoscope there is no tv connection to the direct ophthalmoscope that is very difficult only with the indirect ophthalmoscope i have seen the images were projected for viewer for viewing by the other people around the uh, examination area ergonomics for an ophthalmologist is very important because it is an actually an occupational hazard so in the initial period what happens is for examination of all these equipments which i said uh, for the use of ex, um, equipments you will be bending that side this side and then you will develop all types of musculoskeletal disorders and um, the carpal tunnel syndrome that is also very common like it people and especially because you are working with the, your wrist alone so you will develop all this so you should worry about all this see that you don't develop because these injuries are very chronic in evolution so you won't get to the next day so and uh, its effects will be devastating so what you have to do maintain better work efficiency and redesign your work workspace that is very important that's why i always say, say stay safe not in pandemic season alone you have to stay safe in ophthalmology also how not to sacrifice your body so the 2020 20 principle is there so we ask the students to sit straight and then do all examinations here i am see i am sitting comfortably on the floor and then trying to do a b scan so it is not by just bending that side this side and all you have to necessarily occupy a good position and then do the different test so 20 20 20 is nothing but at the end of every 20 minutes when the people they when they sit on the front of a machine like a computer screen 
you have to take your eyes away and then stare 20 feet far from the screen 